Hi, everybody. It's uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen. I apologize that I could not be with you uh, in New York. I'm at a different meeting uh, here in Southern California, uh, but I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the very exciting progress that we've made over the last 10 years uh, and the conclusion that, that, as you'll see, Alzheimer's is largely uh, a disease of oral health. There are systemic contributors, of course, as well, uh, but it's turning out to be very, very common. And so for best outcomes, it's going to require physicians and dentists working together, uh, as I'll talk about in the next couple of minutes. So just a couple of minutes to talk about the fact that this is really an exciting time where we're getting better results than any time in history. So let me share the screen here and just show a couple of background slides here. And let's see here. Okay. So we're really getting to the point that as crazy as it may sound, uh, Alzheimer's is now optional. And we're seeing this all the time that uh, if everybody would simply get on active prevention uh, at 40 uh, or uh, when you're still asymptomatic uh, or treat in early periods of symptoms rather than waiting for late stage dementia. Uh, we really could pretty much eradicate late stage Alzheimer's and really make it so that you just don't have that problem very often. Uh, we're seeing it again and again and again in our clinical trial, 84% of people actually improve their scores. We now have people who are over 10 years with sustained improvement. I treated the first person back in 2012 and she's just turning 80 and she's doing absolutely great. So we're seeing this again and again and again. And as I say, oral health is huge. So what does it mean for your actual practice? Uh, there are a number of things. First of all, participating in reducing the global burden of dementia and again, uh, the physicians uh, are not getting best outcomes on their own. In our current trial, by the way, uh, which is ongoing at six sites around the country, every single person uh, is seen by a dentist. Every single person has cone beams and, and every single person has their oral microbiome evaluated. So it's part, again, of getting best outcomes. Um, increasing practice size and efficacy. Uh, this is, uh, I, I think this is not yet blessed. Uh, by uh, the standard of care dentistry, but in fact, Alzheimer's is going to be part uh, of the future uh, treatment. Uh, this will be, uh, of course, an important part of what we are all doing. And then being part of a team that addresses the root causes of chronic illness, and I'll show you why that is so important. And then potentially saving someone from your own family or circle of friends. Uh, 45 million of the currently living Americans will die of Alzheimer's if we don't that continue to improve the outcomes, and we really could reduce this number dramatically. So it really uh, dwarfs the pandemic, where we've had over a million Americans, of course, uh, who have died from the Alzheimer from the uh, COVID pandemic. There are many, many more who will die of Alzheimer's disease. And then being part of the movement of 21st century medicine, we are moving away from a standard prescription pad, monotherapeutic, si simple approach to medicine and moving much more toward a network, toward understanding how these things uh, interact. And of course, we've all heard a lot about things like uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum being important in uh, cancers, uh, oral care being important in atherosclerosis, um, and now here, uh, Alzheimer's disease, yet another example of something where oral care is really critical. I want to just mention a word about success because a lot of us have heard about the idea that there are uh, drugs that have been approved recently, uh, but these drugs do not make people better, unfortunately. Uh, they slow the decline very slightly. So here's an example. You can see uh, over a year, you lose about three and a half points on a 30-point scale, such as MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, if you're untreated. If you're treated with lecanemab, which was the one that was just uh, approved by the FDA recently, you actually, you can see here, you slow the decline, in this case, by 27%, but you don't make the people better. And on the other hand, what I'll show you today, which is reversal of cognitive decline, we call RECODE for short, uh, is uh, actually improving people. And this was a published paper. It's freely available online from the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. Let me just show you one example. This is just one of many, many examples. And here's a, a, a disease that has been considered untreatable, posterior cortical atrophy, 
about five to 10% of people who have Alzheimer's disease will present with posterior cortical atrophy. So this typically means that they have visual abnormalities as some of their earliest symptoms. They often have difficulty with visual analysis, recognizing faces, uh, driving, uh, grabbing things in space, uh, recognizing multiple objects at the same time. All of those things are common. And here you can see uh, one woman, and I, I should mention here, the Mayo Clinic has said specifically there are nothing, there's no treatments to cure or slow the progression of posterior cortical atrophy. Well, here's an example that runs counter to that claim. You can see here, this woman, when she presented, was unable to read books, unable to use the computer, unable to do any brain training. And you can see here that her, it is back in 2021, her MRI was quite abnormal. So her total brain matter, less than 10th percentile. The gray matter was not so bad at 24th percentile. Hippocampal volume way down at the sixth percentile. Parietal lobe, and this is the area where typically PCA is uh, mainly uh, hits. You can see here less than the first percentile. And then her occipital lobe, 10.8th uh, percentile. Now, after a year and three months of treatment on the protocol we'll talk about today, uh, here in November of 2022, um, she's uh, just dramatic improvements. Her parietal lobe has come up to the 22nd percentile. I mean, this is essentially, although it's at the low end of normal, this is a normal MRI. Gray matter at almost 38th percentile, hippocampal volume all the way up almost to the 32nd percentile, and the occipital lobe here at the 25th. So there's nothing here below the 20th percentile in her MRI. And meanwhile, for symptoms, she is now reading once again. She's now using the computer once again. She's now doing brain training once again. Now, she's not perfect. She, her vision is not back to perfect, but it is far, far better than it was. And she's quite stable and doing very, very well. So these are the sorts of outcomes uh, that we're seeing with the approach that we'll talk about today. So if you think about this, the, the, this is our research that we did over 30 years. There are four major groups of contributors. And in fact, all of these um, can be related to, uh, to oral health. Um, so anything that is causing inflammation uh, in the brain, and this can be systemic, this can be from uh, oral health, et cetera. So you've got to actually sum up these various pieces so it can be from various infections, changes in oral microbiome, leaky gut, Lyme disease, you know, on and on and on. All of these inflammatory mediators can contribute to this problem. Any toxin exposures, so things like mercury, quite important, things like uh, biotoxins, mycotoxins, things like that, organic toxins, any of these, in fact, can contribute. And then energetics, lowering energetics contributes. So reduced mitochondrial function, reduced oxygenation, which is why sleep apnea is a huge contributor. Um, reduced blood flow, which is why vascular disease is a huge contributor. And then finally, trophic support, nerve growth factor, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, things like uh, estradiol, testosterone, vitamin D, all these things that have a trophic activity in the brain. So those are the four big groups of, uh, uh, of contributors. And we want to then identify and address those things when we are evaluating and treating people. So the role of the oral systemic specialist is a, an absolutely critical one for best outcomes. Um, first, um, evaluating and optimizing oral microbiome. And of course, there are uh, multiple ways to do this now, multiple tests available. Um, and looking to see uh, what, you know, what, what is there? Are you going to be using uh, oral probiotics? Are you going to be using things like dental sidin? Obviously, this is a, an area of expertise for you. Treating gingivitis and periodontitis. Again, uh, a neurologist cannot do this. So uh, we need help. Uh, when, it, when it comes to getting best outcomes for these patients. And many of them do have gingivitis or periodontitis, as you're probably aware. If you actually look in the plaques in the brain, the amyloid plaques, what's inside the amyloid is often things like peat gingivalis. There are other organisms as well. 
uh, but the amyloid that has been vilified in this disease has turned out to be part of the innate immune system. It is a sequestrant, an aggregant, and an antimicrobial peptide. So it's part of the response to these various insults. And therefore, to get best outcomes, you need to treat these things. You need to get rid of the, of the P. gingivalis, et cetera. And then addressing potential toxicity for mercury. Of all the different metals, mercury is the one that is the most associated with Alzheimer's. And in fact, you can simply give mercury um, and create an Alzheimer-looking neuropathology. Now, I, I recognize that some people have claimed that all cases uh, of Alzheimer's are, are due to mercury. Um, uh, that's not what we, we've we seen. Uh, it's due to ma many different things. It's basically a network insufficiency, but mercury is clearly a relatively common player. And then evaluating and treating sleep disordered breathing, uh, whether you're talking about obstructive sleep apnea, upper airway resistance syndrome, or anything else, just look, you know, looking at, uh, uh, at wearables and finding where you stand. And of course, if there's a question, um, sleep studies can be very helpful. Simple oximeters to wear can be very helpful. But this is one of the most common concerns and one of the most common contributors to cognitive decline. And then cone beam identification of abscesses and treating those optimally. And again, uh, for the current trial, which is going on at six different sites around the U.S., um, every single person is getting cone beam evaluation, and a number of them are turning out to be abnormal. And uh, optimal treatment for those does seem to be helpful, again, in getting best outcomes. Um, and then addressing root canals, uh, when, to, when to be concerned about them, when to remove them. And again, you are the experts in this. So we depend on you to help us get the best outcomes with these patients. Um, and then finally, uh, identification of uh, herpes simplex. And uh, Professor Ruth Itzaki uh, from the UK spent her whole career um, looking at the relationship between herpes simplex virus. Uh, one, it turns out there are others like HHV6A, which also are probably contributors. Again, anything that is inflaming the brain, and HSV is a great example, uh, but there are many others, will lead to this innate immune system response where you're now producing the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's. So the old fashioned idea that amyloid happens for some reason that we don't understand, and then the protein just aggregates and that that kills your brain cells, it really makes little sense. In fact, this is part of a systemic response, part of an innate immune response to many different uh, pathogens. And so anything that continues that cont uh, continued uh, exposure to these various insults will continue to make the Alzheimer's worse. And on the other hand, identifying these, sometimes you've got to look uh, to find these various things, but, to ide but identifying them, treating them uh, is so, so helpful to getting the best outcomes. The person I showed you a couple of minutes ago uh, with the uh, PCA um, had Bartonella as one of their species, uh, also had some exposure to various mycotoxins, uh, and these are, again, common, common causes of cognitive decline. And if you don't identify them and you don't treat them, um, then people just continue to go downhill, as you know, and end up in a nursing home. So uh, there is a, there's so much we can do if we simply look and if we simply treat appropriately. Uh, so the good news, we have training. Uh, this is Recode 2.0 training uh, with uh, many, many different world experts uh, from uh, Dr. Cyrus Raji, the neuroradiologist, to Dr. Anne Hathaway, uh, who's, uh, who's a, one of the ones who uh, was in our trial and did, did a fantastic job, uh, expert on uh, women's hormones, for example. Uh, and we, we have a number of uh, other P experts in various uh, toxicity, for example, Dr. Chris Shade, uh, who's an expert, Dr. Neil Nathan, another expert in biotoxins. Uh, so uh, please take a look at this. Um, again, this will help us to get best outcomes. Uh, and we've got so far uh, over 2,000 people around the world uh, who've trained in this uh, and have now, you know, for the first time, getting wonderful results. I just uh, got a wonderful email and had hundreds like this. Uh, of a person who was a pastor who actually uh, moved to a new city, uh, found out that he was 
uh, he was um, developing Alzheimer's disease, actually was diagnosed at both Stanford at University of Utah, um, has done very, very well, has improved and gone, gone back to working. Uh, there's a whole documentary on this, if you want to take a look at that, which is on Amazon Prime, which is called Memories for Life, Reversing Alzheimer's Disease. And you can see some of the various patients and how they have done. Uh, so please uh, consider this. We would Again, we, we really need help to get the best outcomes. The good news is, just as for leprosy and polio, Alzheimer's will become a former scourge. And we're on our way. And we need to continue along this line. So thanks for uh, attending the meeting. Thanks for taking a look at this, and I hope that you'll consider training and being part of the team. I'm going to stop the sharing there. And again, uh, uh, please let me know if there are questions, et cetera. I look forward to talking with you again in the future. Take care.